Aloha and good evening, everyone. It's Tuesday night. It's time for tuning up with Iggy and Dave. We had a very few busy weeks lately. This past week, we had a week off. Uh, Dave, how was your week? My week was wonderful. I, I, had, I had dinner with Iggy. It's like I can't get away. Couldn't get any better than that. No, it really couldn't. No, it was a wonderful week. Uh, we've made some huge progress with the city and the state on our reopening plan for the Waikiki Shell. And if you're watching this tonight, I can tell you that uh, there are still tickets available for this weekend's performance, and you do not want to miss these performances. So, uh, Iggy, who's our guest this evening? We are embarking on an exciting two weeks, Starlight's series number three and four, and we are so pleased to welcome a maestro for those two weeks, Maestro Lydia Yankovskaya. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I understand you flew yesterday from the mainland, from Chicago. I did. How do you feel? I feel great. This morning, I feel great. I don't know about the evening because uh, Chicago is uh, five hours later, but it's great and it's so beautiful and the water is divine. I already went into the ocean this morning, so I can't complain. And you've been slated to uh, be a guest with the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra for a while now. And finally, Dave was able to, uh, to book you. So we're all very excited. So uh, this morning you, um, or rather yesterday you, you, you landed First impressions, I, I imagine you haven't been to Hawaii before? I have not been to Hawaii before and it is gorgeous and the weather is perfect. Actually on the way here I asked Dave if this is what the weather is like all year round or if this is unusual because Chicago it was, it, it was in the low 40s when I left. Uh, I think it was around 43 degrees Fahrenheit. So huge difference even though it's moving into summer. So, uh, so you're both uh, from Chicago. Did you know each other? We did, yes. We were working for not competitor organizations, but partner organizations. Uh, you, Lydia, are with Chicago Opera Theater, uh, an opera company that focuses on what? So Chicago Opera Theater focuses on bringing works to Chicago that have not been heard in the city before. So that includes world premieres and developing new work. It also includes presenting works that are in the canon, but somehow just haven't made it to Chicago yet and also presenting works that have just recently come into the canon. So operas that have become a major influence, but again, that are not regularly presented in Chicago. And this branding started or evolved with you at the helm? Yeah, more or less. So Chicago Opera Theater actually for some time has been a leader in bringing really innovative work to the city. The company is almost 50 years old. Our 50th anniversary actually is the season after next. Uh, but it started out as a company kind of for the people before super titles, COT presented operas without that were in English uh, that were um, seen as more accessible to the public. It also did a lot of new work and uh, was instrumental in developing new work, did a ton of Chicago premieres throughout its history. The, it's over 100, I can't remember the exact number. Um, and then when I came on board, we started focusing a little more on developing new work because that is my something I've been doing a lot of. I love working with living composers. I love developing work that speaks for today and for our culture, for our society. Uh, and also we started presenting a lot of Russian repertoire, actually. I'm originally from St. Petersburg, Russia, and Russian opera, of course, the repertoire of Russian music in general is so, so rich. And in Chicago, amazingly, very little Russian opera had been done besides the few kind of handful or less right. of the most standard pieces, nothing had been heard. So for instance, even with major works like Tchaikovsky's Iolanta, we did the Chicago premiere a or few years Dan ago. Peak, maybe? Yeah, Peak Queen Dom, Spain. yeah, Peak uh, Dom? Queen of Space had been uh, done in Chicago, I think, by the Lyric Opera, but it was maybe that, Onegin, um, Baris maybe had been done a few others, but not very much. So we've been doing a lot of Russian work as well. What has the past year looked like for the Chicago Opera Theater? So we're very fortunate as a company because we fall in this in-between area where we're not too big, so big that we can't withstand the, this crisis, but also not so small. Um, so we have some flexibility as opposed to the large organizations that are tied to massive menus, but we also um, have the resources to make things happen. So amazingly, we have offered more than we ever have in our history. We had offerings every single month of different types. All of them were digital. We unfortunately could not have a live audience. 
So it's very exciting that you for your concert have a live audience for this. Um, a lot of video recordings of things. We did do one outdoor concert early in the pandemic, uh, but otherwise we've had to rethink everything and rethink what opera is because creating opera for film is something very different. Mm -hmm. As you know, all of our orchestral music as well, it's such a live art form. It is about being there in person, feeling the sound coming at you from the stage. And so when you're suddenly creating it for a digital medium, you have to really think differently about what your focus is, how you're presenting it to the audience, how you're touching the audience with what you're doing. There was so much inspirational work that came out of two Chicago Opera Companies, both Haymarket Opera Company and Chicago Opera Theater this past year. And it was wonderful to see the accolades from Opera America and internationally uh, for the way that you both pivoted so quickly. Uh, during the pandemic. So who were the composers? Who, I, right now, who did you work with this, this past year? Who are you excited about? Um, you know, who's your top, we'll go with yeah. six right Well, now. one of the composers I'm very excited about and whose work we just pre uh, presented at COT is Kamla Shankram. Uh, she's an amazing composer based in Brooklyn, New York. We did her opera, Taking Up Serpents, which is about Pentecostal snake handlers. Um, in Appalachia. Uh, the libretto was by Jerry Dye, who uh, comes from a related uh, religious tradition. It was really fascinating, actually. But Kamala takes all of these different sound worlds into her work. And the orchestra actually included electric guitar and whirly tubes, which are basically plastic tubes that create the overtone series, and a water phone, which is this giant percussion instrument that you fill with water and then bow the, the metal of kind of spikes on it with a bow. Really fascinating. So that was one of the pieces we did that I absolutely love. Uh, we um, also, um, uh, next season, we're in the middle of developing a new opera by a composer named Erilyn Wallen, whose work I also adore. I've known Erilyn for many years. She's based in Britain, uh, in London, but also she owns half a lighthouse in Scotland and spends a lot of time there. Uh, but she has written a great deal of symphonic music, has collaborated a lot with the BBC and other organizations in Britain, but also has written almost 20 operas, I think. And they just haven't been presented widely in the States, but absolutely should be. And her music is incredible. So we're doing an opera by her with librettist Deborah Brevoort uh, soon. So Wonderful. Well, if I hope you don't mind, we're going to leave the drama of opera aside because there's no drama in the symphonic world. Um, tell us about the program that we're presenting this week with the Hawaii Symphony. Well, speaking of living composers, uh, one of the composers, which I know you've spoken about on the show too and spoken to on the show, is Michael Fumai, whose music, I'd known his name, but I didn't really know his work until uh, you alerted me to it before we were, when we were programming this um, concert. And I absolutely love, love Michael's work. It has, uh, he has such a range of different pieces. The orchestrations are so colorful and exciting. And I am especially excited about the work we're doing on this concert, which is Full Metal. It's inspired by Full Metal Alchemist, uh, the anime series. And it's, it's forced me to dig in and watch Full Metal Alchemist, which is always a good uh, assignment to have as part of your score study. Um, and it just is so colorful and exciting and dramatic. So I'm really excited for that piece. Um, before we get to the rest of the program, uh, we should mention that I think we may have viewers from the League of American Orchestras. Yes, so absolutely. We say welcome all of you. And the beautiful scenery that you see is the Hawaii Theater Center. So we want to also give a great shout out to Greg Dunn, the uh, CEO of HTC, the Hawaii Theater Center. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Dave, that we've been performing outside uh, this summer. That's been taking you 14, 15 months of work, and we are performing this summer at the Waikiki Shell. Um, and since we're still um, within the League of uh, American Orchestras, I just wanted to give a shout out to our artistic advisor, Joanne Filetta, who uh, obviously, of course, she's the music director of, of the Buffalo, but she's been very involved with the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra in our process uh, through the pandemic. Uh, she's been with her physically, before uh, this uh, situation, but uh, very much involved with you, Dave. So a uh, shout out to all those great people. Um, and before we get to the rest of the program, um, you mentioned that you actually um, were born in Russia, in St. Petersburg. Um, tell us about this uh, clash of civilization, or I don't know, maybe you were too young when you moved to the US, but. Uh, 
Yeah, culture. I mean, the, in the, when I left St. Petersburg also, it was in the 90s, it was right in the middle of the reconstruction. So uh, the um, country was in such a tumultuous time as it was trying to transition from the era of the USSR into what it is now. And kind of Western culture was flooding in and just changing everything. And people weren't sure how to deal with this because I think the assumption was, well, if you, uh, I think from the many of the people who brought kind of a Western and democratic state to Russia or, or were hoping to, um, the idea was that this is just natural and a free economy is just natural and it'll just sort itself out. But of course, in a country where things went from Tsarism directly basically through the revolution to and surfed them to, through the revolution to the USSR, um, none of it was organic for the cultural context. So Russia went through many very challenging growing pains at the time. So Russia, um, Tchaikovsky Hamlet. Yeah. Was that sort of a no-brainer for you to feature a Russian composer? I love performing Russian music because so much of it just speaks to me, but also because there's so much great repertoire that's not necessarily heard. That's right, because we're performing the, uh, the tone poem. Uh, would you call it a tone poem? Or, uh, yes, yeah. Um, um, Hamlet, so we'll, of course we all know um, um, Romeo and Juliet um, based on, on Shakespeare as well, but I, I have to tell you, I've never performed these Hamlet, so tell us about yeah, it. It's so rarely done, which I think is a shame. It's such a dramatic, exciting piece. It digs into, I think, and there are different ways, I think, to approach it or to interpret it, but to me, it really follows Hamlet's journey, not really the other characters in the play, in a sense. Uh, but of course, so much of the play is about the psychology and Hamlet's madness and whether it's real or not, and all the emotions underlying it, all of Hamlet's monologues are so powerful in the play. And so um, the, the tone poem or the piece takes us on this journey. There's a lot of Burst, there's so many bursts of energy, bursts of emotional energy as Hamlet is trying to deal and process with everything right. that's happening. As expected around. in Tchaikovsky music, too. Right? Exactly, exactly. And I wonder if Tchaikovsky also could relate to the play because of that emotional quality of it. Because so much of Tchaikovsky's music is so emotionally astute, it's so close to. To even in pieces that where there are no characters, we, you mentioned a ballet, or of course there are operas, but in the symphonies as well, you could create an emotional journey through each symphony so clearly, and that's the case with this piece. And I think it's just so exciting, and it is so moving, and it's a shame that it hasn't been done more. Very much looking forward to it. Um, you know, I was in St. Petersburg a long time ago, and uh, it was beautiful, and I was in a bus, and and. Um, it seems like every corner I would see a ballet school with uh, little girls and boys, you know, in their tutu <laughs> or ballet outfit. Did your parents uh, make you do ballet or did you actually do and go into sports? You know, this is a really funny question because I did do ballet as a kid and I got kicked out at age, <laughs> uh, at, the, at the tender age of five. I was kicked out of ballet school because I couldn't do it as well as it was expected. I started at age three and I still remember my audition to do ballet. I had to go into this guy's office with my mom and they checked how flexible I was, how good my sense of rhythm and like musicality was. So those things I did well and I was just barely flexible enough and kind of could do, didn't totally have two left feet. So they decided to take me and every day in, in our ballet rehearsals and we had a multiple days a week uh, all the kids we had little notebooks and we had to come up to the teacher at the end and get a grade and I always got C's because I couldn't do the bar exercises well enough so at the age of five after stepping out of turn in a recital which I also remember very vividly and what that felt like I got kicked out of the ballet program and thank God because I went into music instead and it worked out very well so here's a story I have no idea if it's true but a friend of mine argues that in Russia, so the girls go into ballet, and the ones who don't pursue ballet sometimes go into gymnastics, and the really good ones get trained to go to the Olympics. And my friend who's from Europe, <clears throat> she said that maybe that is why Russian gymnasts have a bit of an artistic sense when on the floor performing their routine, whereas maybe in other countries they're more sports oriented where they have to accomplish those you know, somersault or whatever you call it. 
but she thought that maybe in Russia, the gymnast has this sort of artistic sense that they learn when they were ballet dancers. Would, is that, what would you think? <laughs> I mean, I'm not a gymnast and don't know much about it, so it's hard to say. I will say that also, after I got kicked out of ballet, the other thing I got put in at first was ice skating, because that's also where the, they put people who have studied ballet. But, um, I, you know, it's hard to say, of course. I think part of it is also that the arts are such uh, an important part of the culture in general. And that artistic expression is seen as so essential to being human, to being a person. I think sometimes uh, because of the state of arts education in the United States in particular, that in this country we forget how essential the arts are, to what extent they're all around us. This pandemic actually more than ever has made us realize because without film, without music, without literature, what would we have as we're locked inside and, and forced to spend time with ourselves. Um, so I think in Russia, culturally, the arts in every way are just mm. such a huge part of everything. So I, I promise I do want to get to the program, but I'm fascinated by your story. Tell us about your first steps in U.S. territory. In, 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 in the, the US. US, yeah. So my family immigrated to upstate New York, to the Albany area, uh, and uh, it was certainly a big culture shock. It was so different from where I came from. And um, at first also I got put into a Hebrew day school because my family is Jewish, but we weren't, I mean, practicing, or it was more of a cultural, and in Russia it was an ethnic designation, okay. uh, which is one of the reasons that we left because of extreme anti-Semitism there. So uh, I also had to learn Hebrew at the same time as English. It was a school where half the day was in Hebrew, so that made it very exciting. I was only in that school for a year, so luckily um, that I could focus on learning English. But of course, culturally it was so different. Um, I'm very lucky that to my mom, music and the arts were very important because in Russia, it's so much easier to get a high level music education. So as a kid, if you wanna study music, lessons are inexpensive and it's not just lessons. You don't just take a lesson once a week, maybe for an hour or half an hour because it's so hard for a small child, especially to motivate themselves to practice for just once a week. We don't do anything else once a week really that we take seriously. So you take lessons twice a week. If your primary instrument is in piano, you also take piano. Everybody takes theory classes and they're practical theories. So it's not just theory, but theory that you employ. So keyboard harmony and improvisation. Um, everybody has to perform in an ensemble of one sort or another. I was singing also in a select children's chorus that had intensive rehearsals multiple days a week. And so I was very lucky when we came to the United States that I was supported uh, by my family, that I ended up continuing to study piano very seriously. And I ended up in a school that was a public school, but had an enormous music program that was on a very, very high level. Um, so I was lucky to continue to pursue music here. Great. So from piano to the podium, what was the journey? Well, so as a kid, I played piano, but I also played violin. Um, and I played violin in youth orchestras and um, I uh, uh, also, as a, I sang and I sang in all the choirs, and so I ended up accompanying choirs all the time, which also meant leading rehearsals or sectionals. And then one time with my youth orchestra, I won a competition, a concerto competition as a pianist. I was actually, I think, the same age or about the same age as our soloist for this program, which we'll come back to. But I won a concerto competition with a Mozart piano concerto. And uh, I was very lucky to have a conductor in that orchestra who said to me, well, you have some experience leading things from the piano. And you know, during Mozart's time, this would have been led from the piano, not from a conductor's okay. podium. So why don't you lead some rehearsals? And so I, of course, didn't know what I was doing, but I kind of led some rehearsals. And he saw that I really enjoyed this and it came naturally to me. So again, he came up to me. I would have never thought to ask and said, you know, you, this seems to work well for you. Do you want to conduct something at our next concert? Uh, we're doing Dvorak's Seventh Symphony. Do you want to do a movement? <laughs> so I ended up doing a movement of Dvorak's Seven. And again, even then, I was lucky to have real support because again, I had no idea what I was doing. So not only did I have multiple teachers who gave me lessons and showed me what it meant kind of to conduct, but also he gave me extra time. He arranged extra sectionals with the orchestra. And I was lucky to have colleagues or friends who were supportive enough to do this with me and to go along 
with it. Uh, and that was my first experience. And then I kept conducting through college. I, I wasn't sure, I didn't know at that point that's what I wanted to go into, but that was what I spent my time on when I could. Um, and I studied piano and voice in college and also played a little violin for part of it, but mostly conducted and studied conducting uh, and ended up going to graduate school for conducting. And here I am now. A great knowledge of, of many instruments, which is a perfect uh, a vehicle to... Uh, Some to instruments, at least. <laughs> conductor. Uh, so you're based in Chicago. Um, this is what I, I read about our um, um, one of the pieces, the featured piece, uh, Florence Price, uh, Symphony Number no. 4, um, that it was discovered somewhere in Illinois, am I correct? Can you Yeah, so that? Florence Price lived in the Chicago area. Her house was there, and some years back, a lot of her music was rediscovered. rediscovered. Her works were performed by the Chicago Symphony, and she was very prominent in but her day. She, she's not originally from Chicago, is she? You know, I don't know where she's from, I'm not sure. I know that she spent a lot of time in Chicago, and I know she had a relationship with the CSO. Okay. Um, but Florence Price, I mean, it's incredible, especially during that time, in the middle of the kind of early to mid part of the 20th century, for an African-American woman to be performed regularly and to have this relationship with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And it was no mistake, it was because she was an incredible composer and she, I mean, was leaps and bounds beyond everybody and had to, of course, prove herself uh, in order to uh, be at this position at that time, which makes her incredibly inspiring to me, I find. Um, and this work is really, really beautiful. It has not been performed widely. It wasn't published until very, very recently. And Florence Price's music used to be very difficult also to get a, a hold of. So many of these pieces weren't published so many composers like Florence Price were ignored or kind of forgotten by history um, and were ignored by the big publishing houses or didn't have a chance to get published in their lifetimes and so um, that did not continue so it's really wonderful to see her work published now so that we can perform it. Now here's a, a question I don't know if there's a good answer but you know every every composer has some sort of an influence but also something unique about them so would you say uh, Florence Price, I guess, uh, mid-1800s, maybe influenced by such and such, but also I, I understand uh, the, the joba is very unique. I mean, no one else could have composed uh, a movement like that. Uh, your, yeah, your opinion so on, on her influences? I mean, it's, it's always so hard to say because right. it's kind of me in putting my own uh, biases and my own view of, of musical views on it. But to me, a lot of her music is influenced by romantic composers. The brass writing is really fantastic in her symphony. And some of that, I think, just comes from writing for the Chicago Symphony, which has such a long history of having amazing brass playing. Um, in this symphony, as you mentioned, there is in particular a movement called Juba, uh, which is uh, based on a traditional African-American dance that was um, imported from uh, by when when slaves were brought to America they imported certain dances with them but were banned from using instruments by their masters because a lot was communicated through rhythm and through percussion so uh, many of the slave owners were afraid that uprisings would be planned or certain kind of communication that they didn't want happening would happen through drumming. So um, people adopt, adapted styles of dancing that involved hand percussion and kind of beating out rhythms on their bodies. And the Juba dance is one of these dances that has also involved over time. But what's interesting about that particular movement is um, that dance also has served a purpose of saying the unspoken, of basically for people to um, speak amongst themselves about their frustrations with the way that they're being oppressed, even if they can't do so publicly. So it's kind of an, un, an unspoken way to, to demonstrate one's anger at, at their position in, in the world. Um, and so it's fascinating that Florence Price chose to set that. And I wonder to what extent the people hearing the symphony were aware of that um, message underneath it, to what extent Florence Price herself was thinking about making a statement or not, or was she just using the rhythmic and the musical language of the dance? Which certainly she should have, would have been aware of it, at least to some extent. And also, um, to what extent she was bold enough to do this also because this was her fourth symphony and mm -hmm. she was already fairly established. I, I wish we had a chance to go back and speak to her about yeah. all of that. 
So my understanding is um, uh, this um, manuscript was discovered back in 2009. So, um, and um, you know, as as an orchestra musician, I'm looking forward to um, perform her music. And we, of course, need all the publishers to to make the, the parts very clear. You and I had some some talks about the clarity of between the woodwinds and the string players. So, uh, very much looking forward to to this week with this new program. Uh, two pieces that. I'm very familiar with, that Dave is more familiar with, but I believe this is going to be your first time, two treasures of, of Hawaiian music. Uh, one is, of course, the, the song of farewell that, we, that you hear many times, Aloha Oe, but the other one is Hawaii Aloha, which uh, uh, at some point was uh, being considered as a, as a state anthem, um, but now it's Hawaii Ponoi. But uh, anyway, um, Dave, we have two special guests for those two songs. Yes, Raya Helm is joining us on, uh, as a vocalist, and, and our dear friend Kanoe Miller uh, will be joining us for Hula on those as well. Kanoe was a guest on our show earlier uh, in, I don't know, it must have been episode 20 or so at that point. Um, and, uh, you know, well known for, for being at the Halakulani night after night uh, there at uh, House Without a Key. Right. Um, yeah. And thrilled to have her on the stage of the Waikiki Shell with us. And, you know, I think when we were talking about this program, um, when we had the opportunity to perform this for the League of American Orchestras, I th I th the conversation went such that, you know, for us to showcase Hawaii, uh, and to showcase this community, um, one that over the past 15 months I've gotten to know a little bit of, but there's so much history of the music of the Queen and the music of uh, Hawaii that um, I hope that we can share not only uh, with the League of American Orchestras, but all of our colleagues um, performing elsewhere, this rich musical history that is truly unique to us. So. That was the, the story behind those two pieces getting added to the program here. That's right. We, we don't just want to offer some uh, vignettes, but uh, uh, speaking of uh, Kanoe Miller, a um, uh, wonderful hula dancer, and, and my understanding there's sort of two forms of, of hula dancing. There's the more traditional one, and then there's the, the, the one that's more slightly more contemporary when you have more Western music influences. But uh, in my understanding, um, Lydia, you get the royal treatment, you get the, so to speak, um, um, you get the, uh, to perform the arrangements of Michael Thomas Fumai. Um, have you been, I'm sure you've been in communication with him. Has he, I'm, I'm sure you've talked to him about uh, Full Metal. Um, has he also told you a few things about those uh, Hawaiian arrangements? Oh, of course, yeah. Well, for these pieces in particular, I was actually most worried about this part of the program, even though it's the shortest in some ways. And of course, it's the one that the orchestra and our soloists are so familiar with. But this is music that's new to me. Right. So uh, one of the, of course, the first I did a ton of research kind of on the history of this and the history of the Queen and Hawaii and all of these things. But I reached out to Michael uh, because also so much of what I found in terms of performances of both of these pieces is so different from his arrangement. Um, his arrangement is so grand. There's, again, so much to it. It's, it's his big, beautiful, colorful orchestrations. And usually when you, for instance, search for this on YouTube, you get just someone playing the ukulele and singing beautifully in a very intimate environment, which is such a different interpretation of the piece. So I reached out to him and Michael was so kind to actually, he sent me about a dozen recordings of different types for each one, which I'm just so thankful for. So I could I, dig in everything I, from. I should listen to them. Oh, they're great. Yeah. yeah. And, and they included kind of kids choruses of Hawaiian schools and Hawaiian communities to all kinds of things, band arrangements, and also um, stuff that was more intimate of different performers. So I just spent a lot of time kind of digging into those and getting to know the different ways that this music is interpreted. Because one of the beautiful things about it is that there is so much flexibility in how it's presented, and it can serve so many different functions. And Dave mentioned um, our singer, Raya Teahelm. Um, She's um, um, an authentic Hawaiian singer, and I have to look at my notes uh, in, in the style of Leo Kie Kie, which is the, uh, the, the Hawaiian falsetto singing. And, and um, she's a wonderful singer. She wants to make sure um, that she perpetuates the traditional Hawaiian music for the younger generations. Um, Maestro, 
anything else while you're going to be with us for two weeks uh, doing wonderful programs. Uh, we had this segment called uh, Two Day with Aloha where someone would suggest what they should do, discover uh, while on the islands. Uh, any plans when you're going to wake up, smell the roses, smell the coffee too, and hear the, the, the orchestra and work with us? What else do you plan to do? Well, you tell me, because I'm. I actually, I was talking to Dave about this on the way here. He said that you're the expert, and I should ask you where to go and what to see, um, because I, I love nature also, and I love hiking and being in nature. I love swimming. I am. I was telling Dave on the way here that I am a very bad but ambitious surfer. Surfer. So I uh, plan to do some surfing, but again, I, I've have several weeks worth but, of But you're very but. good in the water, is my understanding, right? <laughs> I'm good in the water. I used to swim, but I mean, I'm a good swimmer, and I've but done other water But you were like captain sports. of what? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was captain of my high school swim team, but okay. I, I was very bad. I was terrible. I was the worst swimmer on the team, but but I worked really hard. But I also water ski and I sail, and I, I love being in the water. So for me, being so close to the water, actually, I look out of my hotel room and I see the ocean. So that's exciting. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna try to find a spot to. Uh, uh, attempt surfing and, and do a lot of falling off the board and I'm gonna um, look for some good hikes so if you have recommendations oh and of course uh, the food because yes. there's nothing I like more than raw fish and fresh fruit and I hear you have a lot of both here so and uh, Chicago uh, we do have some lake fish but it's not quite the same so lake fish like <laughs> you, you go in Lake Michigan and you fish yeah, and my whatever local comes out, you eat it. <laughs> <laughs> well, my local farmers market has, sells some uh, Lake Michigan fish. It's, it's, it's some of it is very good, or other Great Lakes. I think yeah. a lot of it is Lake Superior. I think. You want to go offshore? Offshore, yes. yeah. Offshore. <laughs> yes. But uh, Lake Michigan actually now is quite clean. But that's a whole another uh, story. But the water there is a lot colder than here. Right. So I am very excited to be in the water and to be outdoors when we're not in rehearsal. That's right. There are so many ways to discover the place you are, you know, you, 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 hopefully you'll listen to our orchestra and you'll find more things about Hawaii through the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra, oh, sure. um, through the food, you know, the Pacific Island flavors, you'll, you know, um, so many different ways to uh, find more treasures about our islands. Well, and I'm interested in learning about the history also of Hawaii. I, as on the mainland, unfortunately, we learn so little about the history of Hawaii, you know, beside kind of Pearl Harbor, which is uh, such a great tragedy, but other than that. So um, I, it's been interesting even studying these pieces and before coming here, digging into and understanding how Hawaii came to be, how Hawaii came to be a state. Um, and the culture and kind of the richness and depth of this culture. So I'm hoping to learn at least a tiny little bit while I'm here. Well, we are thrilled to have you here for these performances the next two weeks. And uh, to our audience at home, please join us at the Waikiki Shell this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at 7 p.m. Tickets are available, both individual tickets and pod seating. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you there. And for our friends and colleagues across uh, the world, uh, tuning in for the League of American Orchestra's performance uh, on June 17th at uh, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, welcome. Welcome to Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you here uh, and look forward to perpetuating this rich history of music here in Hawaii uh, for all to enjoy throughout our industry. So thank you, Lydia. Thank, thank you, you Iggy. Much, Always nice to spend a Tuesday thank evening you with you. <laughs> and yeah. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Thank you both. Look, and I look forward to seeing you tonight at rehearsal. Aloha.